Hi everyone, um, welcome to um, the second um, talk in our Hidden History Seminar. We're really pleased to uh, see you all here. Um, my name is Ludi Price. I'm one of the co-founders of the Hidden Histories series. Um, just a quick, some quick housekeeping here. Um, we are going to have a Q&A at the end of the talks. Um, so please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat or in the Q&A box. You can do it at any time and someone will pick it up. Um, please stay muted. Um, you might be able to unmute at the end uh, for the Q&A if you prefer to talk rather than type. Um, also, please be aware that this um, session is being recorded. We will be putting it up on um, YouTube. Um, uh, over the coming days and we will be sharing the link with you once um, we're done. So I'm just going to pass this on to Fazana, who, um, my co-creator of Hidden Histories, who also has a bit to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludi. Um, lovely to have you all with us. My name is Fazana Qureshi and I also uh, co-chair the Decolonizing Library Working Group. Um, quite excited about our second talk in the series. Um, so today we will be looking at um, South Asian identity, British South Asian history, and uh, it's going to give us a chance to really um, share uh, those hidden stories that we don't uh, hear or see as much uh, in the mainstream media. I was going to just hand over to you to introduce uh, the, the speakers today. Thank you. It's such a privilege to be here and introduce uh... Binita Kane, Jasveer Singh, and Sparsh Ahuja, our speakers for the day. Thank you very much, Ludi uh, Farzana and the Hidden Histories project team. I really enjoyed the previous uh, lecture and I'm really excited by the whole um, series of seminars. Um, welcome, Sparsh. Let me introduce you first as you will be the first speaker. Um, Sparsh Ahuja is a documentary filmmaker and has received numerous awards and fellowships for his important work on partition and peace building. He has received the National Geographic Explorer Award last year and has been the youngest recipient of the Catch Light Fellowship. He's also recognized for his art artistic work by the Lucy Emerging Artist Scholarship. He graduated from Oxford a few years ago from where he established uh, his uh, project Dastan a peace building in initiative connecting partition refugees with their homes and native places, and as well as sharing these stories through film and virtual reality. And I believe he's now ready to share these uh, through exhibitions across the world uh, in India, Pakistan, the UK, as well as other places. Um, um, so very welcome, Sparsh. And I will introduce all three of you first. So I'm also happy to have Dr. Benita Kane with us. She's a consultant respiratory physician in Manchester, and she's written about the role of race in health and medicine. Uh, she's also brought her family's personal experience of partition to the public by contributing to a BBC documentary um, in 2017, I believe. And since then, she has campaigned for um, the public recognition of empire and racism and the obscuring of British colonial history. Uh, uh, so she has gone to parliament to obtain a formal recognition of partition commemoration day, which is now recognized for August 17th. So that's a, a good start. And she has also founded the partition education group, which includes um, uh, which talks about inclusion of, of uh, these histories in school curricula across the UK. She's also the co-founder with Jasveer Singh of the South Asia History Month, uh, which runs from 18th July to 17th August. So um, very welcome, uh, Jasveer Singh as well. Um, you, uh, you have been... Um, active in the community for uh, in British South Asian communities in Britain. And you're a practicing family law barrister as well in London, so that keeps you busy. Along with your legal work, you are a trustee and patron of several regional and national charities in the faith and minority sector, including the City Seeks and the Faiths Forum of London. Um, you're a regular contributor to Radio Force Thought for the Day and uh, you received the OBE for your community service in 2017. 
Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today and we discuss partition and peace building and reclaiming the history of British South Asians. Um, uh, so I invite Sparsha Huja to speak first as uh, you need to leave early for uh, another engagement. Um, so thank you very much. Hi everyone. Um, everyone can hear me fine? Just checking the sound. Yes, we can. Yep. I'm just gonna, it's gonna share my screen. Uh, because of the technical error, I think you need to make me the host again. Yes, I'm doing that now. Fantastic. All right, can someone give me a thumbs up if they can see the screen? Should be, should be scared. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, through a little of um, the work that Project Dastan has been doing uh, over the past few years. And uh, as Amrita mentioned, we're a collective of um, artists and filmmakers uh, spread out across the UK, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, where we connect uh, partition witnesses from either side of the border uh, to their ancestral homes, uh, either through a combination of virtual reality, uh, sometimes uh, reconnecting them uh, over social media with people they left behind if they're still alive. So I thought um, since the topic of this, uh, of this seminar was hidden histories, I wanted to take you through some of the uh, some of the personal stories of uh, people who have shared their journeys with us over the past few years. Um, and uh, yeah, they've uh, definitely touched me along the way. So hopefully, hopefully you feel the same. Um, what's happening here? All right, so uh, these are six photos um, taken in the 1950s uh, of uh, a man called Ishar Das Arora, who's my maternal grandfather, my nana. Um, these are the uh, oldest photographs we have in our family house. And um, when we look back at our family history, uh, it doesn't go back, uh, the, the physical records don't go back very far. And of course, the reason for that um, is that uh, my grandfather is a, survived the partition in 1947. He migrated from uh, a small village in uh, West Punjab near Atak, just on the border of contemporary Hindustan uh, to Delhi uh, during uh, uh, during the migration. So my Nana is in his 80s today. I think he's about to turn 83. Um, and here he is. He's holding a picture of his um, his two parents, which was taken uh, post partition again uh, yeah, in, in Delhi uh, sometime in, in the 50s. So uh, my family, both my uh, maternal side of my family and, and the paternal side left Punjab um, during the partition and we actually lost any connection to our homeland. We don't have any records from the time. Um, and particularly my Nana would speak, uh, would speak a lot about uh, his, uh, uh, his desire to see his homeland again, um, but also of, uh, of fear and trauma of not wanting to see the other side, but feeling like he wasn't able to get the visa. And even if he had got the visa, that he'd, he'd actually just be terrified because he went through quite a traumatic journey. So um, I've had, uh, and, you know, I was born in Delhi, but I've had like the privilege of uh, growing up um, in Australia and between Australia and the UK uh, over the last five years. And um, I'm, I, I've started, I started sharing back at university um, the story of my grandfather to uh, a few of my friends while I was studying. Um, and despite, you know, where on the South Asian spectrum these friends were, um, they would tell similar stories about their grandparents, despite their religion or uh, national identity or even political identity um, uh, in the present. And so we decided to come together and say, look, if these people can't physically go back and see their old, old homes again, why can't we? as you know, global citizens and 
uh, crucially not even global citizens, but citizens who uh, have foreign passports and are able to travel across these borders, um, is a, a sort of virtual uh, way that we could facilitate uh, this kind of desire to to go back and um, and and see that long lost home. So at Project Dastan, we uh, have it's a very simple process. We interview survivors of partition, and it doesn't matter where in the world they are. We've interviewed people across, I think, now six different countries, uh, including diaspora and um, obviously within India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh themselves. We then use our uh, cross-border volunteer team, you know, for the first two and a half years. And it's interesting in in um, in the participants. I saw Shreya Gupta today was one of our past volunteers. So thank you. Um, but we've yeah, we use a cross-border volunteer team to track down the locations of um, the people's old homes. And when we interview people, we actually ask them very specifically about places that they remember and would like to see again. So. Um, you know, things like mosques, schools, temples, places they used to play, um, particularly fond memories that they've had. Um, so then a volunteer goes out and by participant, participant by participant, finds uh, the individual memories connected to these people's lives. Um, we then film these, uh, film these uh, uh, locations as they exist today uh, in virtual reality, edit that footage, um, and then all of it goes back uh, to uh, the partition witness as they in their homes today and they get like a customized personalized experience um, of their past home uh, as it is today and it, obviously it triggers a lot of emotional reactions for people who haven't seen their home in, in often 75 to, to uh, 80 years depending on how old they were when they migrated. So I just wanted to share um, particularly some, some key stories that have stood out along this journey. Um, starting with the first story that we tracked, uh, I think this was two years ago. It was actually, we had been uh, at university, we'd been talking about this idea for a while. And, um, you know, after a lot of campaigning and a crowdfunder, uh, you know, a crowdfunder campaign, we finally got a little bit of funds to, to like send some volunteers out. Um, so, uh, the two men on the right, uh, the, the man on the furthest on the right is his name is Iqbaluddin Ahmed, um, and to his left is his cousin Badruddin Ahmed. Now, they both live in South London today, uh, but uh, both of them were born in uh, a village called Roper, which is now the name has been changed to Rupnagar, but it's uh, it's it's near Chandigarh in, in present day uh, Indian Punjab. And, you know, during the partition, they had a very kind of violent and, um, yeah, like heartbreaking migration across into, uh, into Lahore, subsequently Faisalabad, and then, uh, and then they moved, moved to London in, in the 60s. And, you know, their entire family has now grown up here. So uh, uh, Iqbal's daughter got, no, uh, actually Badaruddin's daughter got in touch with us over Instagram and said, look, we've heard that you've been doing these kind of virtual reconnections and we'd love for uh, you to, to find this place. So on the left, there's a picture of a mosque with a Sikh. If you look closely, there's like a Sikh man um, standing in front of it. Now, this is the, uh, so unlike, unlike my grandfather, um, Iqbal had actually brought this photo across during the partition. And it's the mosque in his ancestral village, which was the only memory he had of that time. And uh, of course, the, the man in the mosque, the man in the picture, the Sikh man, is, was one of his uh, childhood friends, Narendra Singh. So um, we went out to uh, we went out in um, 2019 to this village called Chakarma, just outside Ropa, um, uh, showing people this, the picture of this mosque and um, seeing what we could find. And this is what we this is what we saw. And uh, honestly, we were a little dejected because we didn't at the time we didn't realize that this was the same mosque. Obviously, a lot of it doesn't look anything like the picture. And we were about to turn around and you know tell the local guide who was accompanying us, no, this 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 isn't it. Um, but as we compared the photos really closely, we actually realized no, this is the this is the exact same place. Um, it's just that over monsoons and because the Muslim community had fled the had fled the town, uh, there wasn't uh, anyone to take care of it, and the, the mosque had kind of crumbled. Uh, 
so we had found this mosque and we realized we were in the right place. So we went around Chakkarma and we recorded all these like memories for Iqbal and, you know, Bada and what they'd remembered. But then we realized, well, there's one big thing missing in these pictures that we haven't actually circled here. And that's the, the Sikh man, Narendra Singh. So <laughs> what we did was we went back to the, the local Dhaba. If you guys have traveled around South Asia, you'll know what a Dhaba is and um, disturbed everyone who was eating their paranti and their pakora and whatnot and said, look, we have this picture and um, that's all we know about it. This man's name is Narendra Singh. He used to live around this area. We don't know if he's alive or dead, uh, but there's, um, there's uh, someone in Pakistan who'd like, to, who'd like to meet him again. And surprisingly, someone actually knew of this family. And so while Narendra Singh had passed away, unfortunately, uh, in Chandigarh, which is around a two and a half hour drive away, we, uh, we found his wife who was still alive. And so I'd just like to show you a short video, which is um, her talking to Iqbal um, for the first time, actually. Um, but they obviously heard so much about each other and these families had lost contact. This was before the age of WhatsApp and Facebook and so on. So um, hopefully this plays. Let me know if you can't hear in the chat, but I think I've I'm sharing sounds, so. Hello. Hello. Yes. Am I speaking to Mr. Iqbal Uddin Ji? Um, I'm calling you from Ropar, India. MashaAllah, Are you really? Cousins Iqbal Uddin and Badr Uddin migrated from Rootnagar in India to Pakistan during the 1947 partition. Iqbal only has one object from his time in India, this photo of a mosque in his village. The man in the photo is his childhood best friend, Narendra Singh, who he hasn't seen in 72 years. Narendra unfortunately passed away some years ago, yet we managed to find his wife in Chandigarh and put her on the phone with Iqbal Adin and Badr Adin for the first time in 72 years. मैं फोन दूंगा किसी को आप उनसे बात करना और कुछ नहीं अच्छा हेलो भाई साहब मैं कुलदीप बोल रही हूं डॉक्टर कौन साहब कुल कुल कुलदीप हां नरेंद्र डॉक्टर नरेंद्र की वाइफ ओ माय गॉड ओ चाहिए देखिए जी मेरा जो भाई है ना वो नरेंद्र साहब के क्लास फेलो होते थे अच्छा जी इतना उनका प्यार था हां जी के आप अंदाजा लगाएं कि जब हम यहां पर थे हां जी उस वक्त भी उनका खत आया था अच्छा आपसे मिलकर आपसे बात करके इतनी खुशी हुई ना उनकी वालदा भाई साहब से बहुत प्यार करती थी क्योंकि मेरा ख्याल है नरेंद्र साहब के वालिद जरा जल्दी फौत हो गए थे जल्दी चले गए थे तो ये कि भी ये तो आप भाई साहब से बात कर सकती ना कॉपी नहीं फिर कर लेंगे उनका नंबर दे दिया मैं मैं इनको बताता हूं ये कर देंगे अगले साल बस ठीक है आप मिल गए यही बहुत है आपका फोन नंबर फोन नंबर है मेरा आपके पास हां दे दिया 
अब ठीक करेगा मेरी वाइफ भी यहाँ है वो भी इसी वाइफ भी है मैं तो चल फिर रही हूँ अभी ठीक हूँ अब अभी कहाँ पे है कहा से बोल रहे हैं अभी चंडीगढ़ के पास से इंडिया में है वो तो बहुत बहुत महंगा फोन है आपका तो बड़ी आपके लिए महंगे वाला फोन है तो आप जब भी मुझे याद करें मैं जो खिदमत कर सकता हूँ करूँगा आप लंदन में आना चाहें कोई और कोई काम मेरे लिए हो बताए जरूर बताएंगे हाँ आएंगे कभी देखेंगे जरूर आएंगे आप नंबर तो आपका है तो देखेंगे अच्छा जी अच्छा जी So, um, uh, yeah, that 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 of course was Kuldeep um, chatting to Iqbal and Badar for obviously the first time since partition, uh, and I guess the point of sharing conversations like these and these histories is to uh, encourage people to think outside the boxes that national history has constructed for us as citizens of India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, or even in the UK of what's accepted history and. who we can be friends with and who we can't be friends with and and look below that and um and seek that uh, common humanity which people who lived before this time can remember because uh, they existed in a framework where nationalisms were imposed on them as much as uh, as much as were attained so um to share a little bit of the the five step process of you know kind of reconnecting people to their old homes but we soon realized that you know, there is so much there's such a wealth of uh there's such a wealth of content here and as a team we want to make sure that especially with next year being the 75th anniversary that uh people are able to learn from these stories and so we thought why don't we exhibit this content to the world so currently we're uh producing two um two film experiences that next year all of you will be able to will be able to experience for free um the first is child of empire which is a interactive vr journey of the partition told as a conversation between iqbal and my grandfather and um as they play like a board game we kind of go back through their through their childhood so you know in the in the bottom right you see like a holy game being played out in my nana's village and then there's riots in iqbal's village and then my nana had to take a train and so on so you kind of go through that journey um and it exposes people to both sides of that narrative so you're never really sure whether you're in a hindu story or a muslim story but i guess the point is that it doesn't matter um and yeah you finally end up at this refugee camp uh there's also three short animations which uh th- this will be around in film festivals and museums next year so keep an eye out for that um and i think it will be coming to london around uh july next year um there's also a three part animated series called lost migrations where we're trying to take some of the stories that have been uh lost because of the uh two two kind of narrative dominance we see when you study partition one is like the domination of punjab over other regions in terms of the way that partition story is told even though partition was an event as large and you know, arguably as large as world war 2 um so we're trying to bring in some of those regional stories to counteract the hegemony that punjab has over the narratives in india and pakistan um uh and then the second is how male dominated some of these stories of partition are so the three stories we're doing is one is a story called rest in paper which is kind of inspired by sadat hasan mando if any of you've read him um and franz kafka and it's kind of showing how borders made people stateless and how paperwork encouraged that and um people were forced to prove their identity um and i'm not going to name any particular laws that have been passed in india recently but you can read between the lines of how that history is repeating itself um the second is an episode called sea birds which is about um the chettiar tamil community who were actually not caught up on that side of the border but more towards people who came from singapore and burma and um were were in as much tied up in british colonization as the japanese uh incursions in that region around the time and how they had to kind of grapple between this very indian south indian identity but also southeast asian identity um so that's told as a conversation between 
um, a small girl and her grandmother. Uh, and finally, we have a piece called Sultana's Dream, uh, which is based off a 1907 text, feminist text called, uh, again, called Sultana's Dream by a Bengali author, Rukhaya Hussain. Um, and all of these are short documentaries, which will be available next year. So that's Project Dastan in a nutshell, and I hope um, uh, you've learned a little bit more about the work we do. And um, yeah, I look really look forward to sharing some of these films with with everyone next year as we go on tour so um thank you so much for having me and um yeah uh i'll leave it to benita and just here to continue from here thanks so much sparsh that was fascinating and uh, i'm sure everybody's wants to know more and will attend all the events. Um, it's incredibly moving when they spoke to each other. I was tearing up and congratulations for that emotion. Capturing that phone call and emotion is really, really interesting. So I'm afraid you don't have time for questions. So we will ask the questions uh, addressed to you uh, perhaps later, uh, and uh, I know Benita and Farzana also associated with the project and they know a lot about it. So hopefully they can answer on your behalf. So, yeah, I've also thanks. left my, I've left my email in the chat if anyone needs to get in touch, so. Oh, that's good. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, so over to Benita and Jasveer, I believe you are presenting together and you share with us your ideas of South Asian Heritage Month and bringing South Asia more in school and the mainstream to understand racism, Thank colonialism. Thanks very much. Thank you, Marita. Uh, and it was wonderful seeing Sparsh's presentation. It's always, um, for us, the, seeing the those stories really mean a lot to both myself and Benita, um, because the reason why we set up South Asian Heritage Month and the work that we do comes from uh, our own stories and the ways in which we have come to understand our own histories. Um, so South Asian, I think I just need to be uh, made a host again in order to share my screen. Um, there we go, perfect. So I will share my screen now. So we're going to talk about South Asian Heritage Month. We're going to talk about um, how it came into being, what the genesis of it was, why we think it's important to do this. And we'll also talk about what we've done last year, what we've uh, done this year, and look to the future. What are we going to be doing for next year? What are our ideas? What are our hopes and aspirations? So when we start with um, the story, we have to go back to 2017 to really understand why South Asian Heritage Month came into being. Now, we've already heard from Sparsh about the, uh, the anniversary next year, the 75th anniversary of the events of 1947. And the events of 1947 can be summarised in this way. Uh, there were three events. One was the independence of India from British rule, from the British Empire. The second was the creation of East and West Pakistan, East Pakistan now being Bangladesh, uh, and the partition of the regions of Punjab and Bengal, the partition story which Sparsh has so eloquently spoken of and given such an important, um, addressing the in depth the, the importance of partition, but also making sure that we talk about partition without just referring to Punjab. We refer to everywhere where partition took place and all of the difficulties that were involved um, and the tragedies, really. Now, 2017 was the 70th anniversary of all of those events. I was involved in a project that was known as the Grand Trunk Project. And it was a project where we received some funding. We were able to go around the country talking about the 70th anniversary and talking about it from the perspective uh, of those who were, uh, who had some sort of connection with the subcontinent. Now the Grand Trunk Road, as I'm sure all of you are aware, 
runs from Bangladesh, goes straight through India, through Pakistan uh, and into Afghanistan. It connects South Asia in a way that perhaps very few other uh, roads do. And it's a road which can trace itself back to at least 2000 years, if not, if not longer. Um, as a result, it's an important road. Um, and we wanted to show that just as a Grand Trunk Road links up all of those areas, the Grand Trunk Project was about creating dialogue, creating opportunities for people to talk and to mark the 70th anniversary as they felt best. I'm gonna go a bit further back though, just to talk about my own um, background. So I'm Punjabi Sikh, I was brought up in London, born and brought up here. Uh, and I went to university in London uh, and one of the modules, I, I did a history degree. Uh, and my, uh, my interest in history has always been there from my early days. Um, doing the degree, I realized that I had, uh, I did my degree at King's. Um, so please don't say anything too bad about King's whilst I'm here. Um, I did do a module at SOAS and I did medieval Indian history at SOAS. And learning about medieval history, being able to join the dots up really about my identity as uh, a young South Asian British man uh, living in London and connecting the dots up with medieval Indian history and seeing how that then changed over time, the encroaching and the expansion of the British Empire, the annexation of Punjab uh, in 1849, and then coming to the present day. Uh, all of those journeys and all of those um, historical uh, facts are really important for me. And I think that's why I went on to become a, a barrister. Um, but as a barrister, I've also realized that it's so important for me to stay connected with my roots. And that was where the Grand Trunk Project came from. It was that idea of making sure that people can mark their history and mark their stories in the way that they feel is best. So that was the work that was done in 2017. Uh, we had a series of events that took place all across the UK. Bottom left hand corner, you can see uh, an event which took place at the Guild Hall, uh, where we had um, uh, musical performances, we had um, theatrical performances. I spoke about the importance of marking the anniversary. And then we took it on a tour. We went to um, Southampton, we went to Peterborough, we went to uh, Birmingham, we went to uh, Luton, uh, and we also went to Manchester. Uh, and I'm going to hand over now to uh, Benita. Thank you, Jasper. So I'll make the connection with that Manchester um, event uh, in just a moment. But my story really comes from a very, very different place. So unlike Jasper, I was brought up in a very white rural area in North Wales. I was the only Asian person in my school for many, many years. And I think when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a medical family. Uh, I knew very little about history. My, my knowledge of history is GCSE um, history <laughs> at school level. Um, and I just genuinely hadn't paid much attention to my roots um, and just wanted to fit in as a teenager and almost didn't want to think about my roots. Um, and I think probably carried on through life pretty much um, in, in that mode getting into my career as a doctor and then everything changed in 2017 when um, I was invited to contribute to this TV program called My Family Partition and Me and my father um, as a young boy was caught up in the violence that happened during the partition of Bengal uh, and I, I always knew that story but I think I just didn't really know the historical context and I was the first member of my family in over 70 years to go back to the village where he and his family had to flee in the middle of the night in terror from the violence that had broken out. And I got to sort of walk in their footsteps. I got to meet people who actually remembered my family, um, which was just incredible, um, and understand the kind of horror that they had gone through at the time. And it was a profoundly moving experience for me and I came back filled with this sense of, wow, I just, I just didn't know 
so much of, of, of this history. And this is me, I've been through the British schooling system, I've done GCSE history, and I knew nothing about my own history and heritage and, and had never really been encouraged to learn about it. Quite the opposite, actually. I think nobody, I didn't feel growing up that my history was important. Um, so I, I was incredibly lucky to take part um, in this project. And I think it was, it was the information I then subsequently taught myself. <laughs> and I, I learned all about what then happened after the Second World War, how so many uh, people from the Commonwealth and from South Asia came to Britain, there was waves of migration, they came as citizens and they helped rebuild the country. And then people like my dad, who has got an amazing story, he went from a, a being a refugee, penniless, um, you know, losing his father as a, at a young age after partition, to making his way to being a doctor and coming and working in the NHS and devoted his life to the NHS. So after 49 years, he retired. Um, and I just thought, wow, people just don't appreciate that. So. Uh, so I think that was part of um, a, an awakening for a number of people. And the BBC did a brilliant job. They did a whole series of, of uh, programming at that time and really raised awareness and kind of catapulted this history into the public domain in a way that it hadn't been done before. Um, and after that, I started sort of campaigning really around education and trying to... <sighs> right that wrong I think I just felt this real sense of injustice that you know we don't teach our kids about this stuff um and I was invited to go and speak at the Grand Trunk Project in Manchester so me and my dad went along and we took part in one of Jasvir's events which is kind of where we um connected for the first time um so next slide Jasvir see what's next So, so the, the campaign was really twofold that I, I started. One was around um, having a partition commemoration day and <clears throat> invited a, <clears throat> excuse me, invited about 100, 150 people to come to the Houses of Parliament. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> got a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> um, for an event where we talked about why it was so important to um, recognize and commemorate this history. Um, this infographic that you can see was, was drawn on the day it was sketched by an artist who was at the event. And it, it, I could talk for a long time about this, but it, it kind of really captured the spirit of those discussions. And, um, you know, wh why do we want to do this? It's about a deeper shared understanding of our British Asian history. And it wasn't just about remembering the violence and all the awful things that happened, but it was also remembering some of the incredible stories like the fact a Muslim family risked their own lives to help my Hindu family escape. And those stories of neighbors, sheltering neighbors had really been lost, I think. And a lot of the hatred had been passed down the generations. And I think a lot of kids growing up knew they weren't supposed to like a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh, but they didn't really know why. Um, so that led to the kind of the, the idea of a partition commemoration day, but also um, setting up the Partition Education Group, which brings together academics and teachers and students from all across the UK who are now trying to work on developing curriculum materials. And it's been really complicated trying to unpick all of the education side of things. It's really not as simple as just putting something on the curriculum um, <clears throat> when you start scratching under the surface. And then that takes us to sort of late 2018, where Jasphere and I met up in London face to face. It was the first time we'd actually met in person um, because we recognised we both were trying to do similar things, um, but coming from very different directions. <clears throat> and, um, and we sat and had a cup of chai and um, we discussed how it was actually quite hard to gain a lot of traction when you're just talking about partition, because <clears throat> it's very difficult for people to get behind that because it's a difficult subject. People don't like talking about it. So Jasvis suggested, well, let's, we need to really think about bringing that celebration element in as well. And that's how the, the concept of having a South Asian Heritage Month was born. And our motto is now celebrate, commemorate and educate. Um, and I'll hand over to Jasvina to sort of talk about the dates because people think they're a bit random. Um, 
but these dates were important to us and maybe to tell you a little bit about the kind of the ethos of the campaign. Sure, thank you, Benita. Um, so yes, it was about trying to make sure we could keep the momentum going. Uh, there was such an appetite for people to find out about what had happened in uh, 1947, what had happened during partition, um, but the appetite was growing. It was going beyond just about partition and people wanted to know more about South Asian identity or uh, British history and how it's connected to South Asia. Now, the dates are significant. They're taken from 1947 as well. The 18th of July is the day that the Independence of India Act gained royal assent uh, under King George VI in 1947. The 17th of August is important because that's the date that the Radcliffe line was announced, the line that the uh, famous or infamous civil servant, Cyril Radcliffe, uh, put together, drew down along a, a map and said, right, this is where Pakistan will be, this is where India will be. And we wanted to ensure that the undercurrent of how South Asia has its present day shape really um, sat behind what South Asian Heritage Month was. It needs to be the strand that runs through it, um, but it goes beyond that. Uh, and it also, the other things that we were thinking about was about the kind of Northern Indian calendar, the South Asian calendars, the, the way that the months fall. We've just had Diwali and Diwali marks the beginning of a month. So the way that um, the South Asian calendars fall is very much that the the, the dates fall at certain parts uh, within within the year, um, mid mid Gregorian calendar, effectively. So the eighteenth of July and the seventeenth of August falls into the uh, the summer month of uh, Sarvan uh, or Sarvan, uh, and it also um, falls into the time when uh, South Asia is going it's undergoing the monsoon season, its season of renewal. We wanted to make sure that this was really grounded in what is important to South Asia, even if it meant that the dates didn't necessarily marry up to the uh, the Western calendar. But that's part of the authenticity of it. It's about owning our own stories. And obviously, as part of that, we need to talk about how much of an impact British Empire had uh, on South Asia. There are um, various countries that make up South Asia, and there are eight countries are, are listed here. And you can see how South Asia looked uh, back in the um, at the beginning of the 19th, uh, sorry, 20th century, uh, and how it looks now uh, from a, a Google map, from a, um, a satellite perspective. And Britain has had a major role to play in each of those countries. It's either uh, had those countries annexed to the British Empire, such as India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka or it's governed, uh, and Bangladesh, or it's governed their foreign policy for either a small period of time or a long period of time. And that includes the Maldives, Nepal, Bhutan, and Afghanistan. Afghanistan, in fact, Britain was uh, control of foreign uh, policy, I believe for about 40 years or so in the late 19th century. So when we talk about Britain and empire, it's more than just saying that these formed part of the empire. It's more about saying, well, there was British India, but there were also the regions around which are important for us to remember as to the impacts that that uh, that Britain played in those particular countries. So we have our concept launch in Parliament in July 2019, uh, and I'll hand back to uh, Benita to just uh, tell you more about that day. Yeah, this was a this was really just to, for us to drum up some some support, and we had a really mixed audience there. We invited. Um, many of the people who had been uh, who had enabled us to really do what we have done so we were building on a lot of hard work that had been done by other individuals and, and groups not just around raising awareness of history like partition um, but who had been trying to campaign um, around South Asia and uh, heritage more widely um, we had I think one of the highlights for me was a, a, a 12 year old girl Samaya Mohammed, who we invited, who'd had a similar um, journey to me. She'd been over to uh, trace her grandmother's story in India as part of a news round special for children. 
Um, and she did this real rabble rousing speech about why it's so important to, te to teach our next generation where they come from and about their histories. And that was just brilliant. But we had um, we had the world of media there. We had museums. We had artists. We we had all sorts of people. And you can see um, on our panel there, we've got Kavita Puri, who 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 wrote um, Partition Voices, um, very harrowing but fantastic read. If you haven't read it, um, we had a number of members of Parliament as well, and um, people like Anita Rani and Babita Sharma, who've been really big supporters of the campaign. Um, but you can see here the infographic again done by us, uh, the same artist, uh, British children, we have the right to learn our shared history in its entirety. And I just thought that was really um, powerful. Um, so that, that was really great. And we then got lots of support to launch South Asian Heritage Month proper in 2020. And we had planned a number of sort of face-to-face -face events then, of course, in the new year, the pandemic hit. Um, I'm, I'm a respiratory doctor. I got very distracted with other things for about six months. Um, and it kind of, there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen. And all of our plans basically went to pot. Um, and about five or six weeks before um, the month was due to kick off, Jasper and I just got together and said, look, we're just going to have to can the whole thing. But why don't we try and do something online? Um, so at this stage, it was just the two of us. Um, Anita uh, got involved. Um, we had some help from Manchester Museum and we just came up with a hashtag. We didn't even have our own website. We had nothing. Um, and it and we just did a call out saying we want to do this. Um, we just put it out on Twitter, on Instagram and said, like, come and get involved. Um, and people did in their droves. Um, and before we knew it, we had a bunch of volunteers who uh, were going to help us do this. They quickly set up social media accounts for us and pulled together this incredible program of um, around 60 odd, 50 odd events that we put on during the month um, with no resource whatsoever other than goodwill and passion. Um, we ended up launching it on uh, BBC News. Um, Anita got some of her high profile friends like Nadia Hussain and various other celebs to, to, to tweet about it and, and do videos. Um, and by the end of the four weeks, the hashtag, which was a brand new hashtag, um, had made 87.2 million impressions across social media, reaching um, over 30 million individuals around the world, uh, which just exceeded all of our expectations by such a long way. And um, it, it just kind of blew up, um, which was amazing. It, it, it yeah. really did. And it was just such a, um, I think it, it's, it's weird to say this, but in a way for us to then have to go online was a blessing in disguise because we made far more of an impression than we would have done if we'd kept to the, uh, to the on uh, to the events in real life i think we were only talking about something like half a dozen events in london half a dozen in manchester maybe a couple in birmingham if we could stretch that far um but it was it was amazing the uh, the way in which we were able to uh, with the support of so many people within our team to change very quickly change tack i mean on our first day on the launch day i think we worked out we um managed to reach about 15 million people um via Radio 4, where I did my thought for the day. Um, Anita Rani was on Radio 2 with Zoe Ball uh, and then the BBC Breakfast. So collectively, we managed to reach 15 million people on a single day, which um, really set the bar quite high for us, didn't it? Oh, it certainly did. Um, and then we were almost left with a bit of a problem that we just didn't have infrastructure and people thought we were a thing and we kind of weren't at that stage. Um, but it was all good problems to have. And um, so then the following year, we worked really, really hard on trying to get a bit more infrastructure in place, um, trying to register as a charity, developing a, the volunteer team a little bit more. And then we came up with key topics and themes for 2021, um, which were around identity, history, kind of the creative arts sector, sports and, and health and well-being, which is obviously close to my heart. Um, and again, we just put a call out to the public around about May time 
and said, look, we got no funding. We haven't got really very much at all. <laughs> we just, but we want to do this. Will you help us? And, and again, managed to put together this really rich calendar of events um, with so many different um, topics. Um, wasn't there, Jasper? It was just so yeah. many but diverse things that people talk, wanted to talk about. It was, it was incredible. So, you know, we had um, things such as talking about South Asian arts within medicine or poetry nights. We had uh, art and um, art being created. Uh, we had um, various exhibitions that were being spoken of. We had parties. We spoke about Brick Lane, its past and future. Um, we had a specific LGBTQ plus strand of events as well. One of the things about what we're trying to achieve with South Asian Heritage Month is to make it as inclusive as possible. Uh, and so whereas many other festivals of this nature or awareness months may want to focus on certain things and not others, we're taking the approach of if this is what people want to talk about, let them talk about it. It's, it has had its kind of ups and downs. And if you have a look, there's an event on the um, 27th of July, Tuesday the 27th, which was about policing, which we then didn't take, uh, didn't take place because of the way that it was um, put together, the way that it was being described, we felt that it needed to be far more nuanced than what it was being described as. But this was part of our learning process. And one of the things that I, I like to talk about is to point out those, those sorts of events and say, we work with our audience and we hear what the audience says. So if we get feedback that actually this particular event shouldn't be taking place for X, Y, and Z reasons, we'll think about it, we'll consider it, and then we'll act upon it. And I think that's one of the reasons why for this year, the engagement has been even greater than it was last year, because we've had that sense of fluidity. We've got our own website now, which is southasianheritage.org.uk. We've had a, some time to build up an infrastructure. Last year, our team was four people strong. This year, our team grew to 15 people strong, and it continues to grow. Um, and we've also had a real increase in the uh, the number of people who engaged with us this year via our hashtag. We had over 70 million reach. And I think we had just about a quarter of a billion impressions over the four and a half months. So that's a real, that's a substantial increase from what it was last year. But again, it feels like we're, we're raising the barrier each year. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's still entirely voluntary. We're all doing it for free. So we've had no money come to this so far. Uh, we've spent no money apart from our own pockets. We're now trying to fundraise in order to make this uh, a slicker machine, but also just to make sure that the movement, as we like to describe it, of South Asian Heritage Month continues to grow and expand, but continues to be as inclusive as possible. Yeah, and uh, you, you said four months, but actually it was four weeks that the hashtag made that impression. So it kind of, it was, there was yes. such a massive, massive engagement. And, and then we sort of found that companies like Apple were doing stuff for South Asian Heritage Month that we hadn't even actually directly approached them about it. They'd kind of heard about it um, and had put together some events where these really huge corporates um, like HSBC and Apple and Spotify and um various others who all did something for South Asian Heritage Month um just organically and and that's kind of how we would like it to grow although we'd clearly like to go with our cap in our hand to some of those companies as, as well and say can you you know help us um and and I think what was nice was we had a really good mixture between um kind of things that were fun like the cooking class and and you know the bounce bangra brothers doing um some aerobics and things to some really thorny topics as well and certainly around the health um side of things people just wanted to talk about um things that are stigmatized you know menopause and mental health and cancer and um domestic abuse and and, and some some topics that there isn't really this platform to talk openly about and that's something I was really proud of is that people said thank you you've given us a platform to talk about these these things um yeah, and yeah it's, that's, I think that's a really important aspect of this the fact that we've been able to create this platform but it's really for others to occupy the space where I'm I like to think of myself and Benita as being the custodians of South Asian Heritage Month but we don't necessarily own it. 
this is for everyone. This is about making sure that people can participate, do events that they feel are relevant. And as we're talking about history and hidden histories, make sure that we start having those discussions about the, uh, the journeys which took place, the impact that empire has had on British identity, uh, as well as on South Asian identity and continues to have uh, an impact. Um, we've obviously all heard of the, the horrible uh, and absolutely horrific abuse that uh, Azim Rafiq has had to endure um, whilst as a cricketer. Unfortunately, I think many of us have had to deal with similar things, perhaps to a lesser extent, sometimes to a greater extent. And those are stories which need to be spoken of. All of this is about making sure that, uh, in my words, certainly, we can get to a point where we don't need to have South Asian Heritage Month. My, my hope would be that South Asian heritage history identity is so embedded within British uh, Id uh, identity and within British society that we no longer need to have this awareness month. But if we have a look at how long Black History Month has been running, that's 34, 35 years, and it's still necessary now more than ever, perhaps. So who knows how long South Asian Heritage Month will be around for. Uh, and whilst it's around, myself and Benita will be doing all we can to, to keep it going. Um, we've We've thought of the, an idea as to what we'll be doing for South Asian Heritage Month next year. We're going to be looking at the anniversaries, the major anniversaries which are taking place next year, such as the 75th anniversary of partition independence and so on. Uh, and we're also going to be looking at the 50th anniversary of the uh, flight of the Ugandan Asians uh, and their, um, their escape, effectively, uh, them being told to leave the country virtually overnight and having very, very just a couple of months to uh, to do so so our, our theme will be quite wide i don't think we're ready to announce it just yet but it will be connected to those particular uh areas so please do watch this space i think i think that brings us to the end of our talk um and you know we'd love to have any questions or or hear your ideas really and and obviously we really want people to get involved as well um we're always looking for volunteers so um our we can pop our email address it, it in the chat as well and if people want to get in touch that's fine yeah thank you very much benita and jasveer um that's a great introduction and an invitation Really, I feel you've presented it so openly and welcomingly. I feel I should volunteer tomorrow for it. It's really, and it's an exciting project. It's really, um, as you describe it, it's building and growing. And um, it's really something that's co quite capacious that has space for so many different things. Um, I thought I'll start off with a couple of questions just to start the conversation. And I thought the really most important thing for me was that you have not focused on community. There are so many community groups in South Asian heritage and you haven't described the Heritage Month as a month for communities, which I think um, because they're caste-based religion or sectarian groups or national groups, even going back to South Asian nationalities. Um, uh, but you have tried to keep it open for all. And maybe if you'd like to describe how, how, that, how that process went, did you have to deliberately or consciously do this or did, is that just how it happened? Um, so I'll start first. When it came to uh, the work that I've been doing um, for many years, I've been involved in various faith communities. I'm an interfaith activist. I do thought for the day, so I talk about my faith and my identity openly. Um, but when the Grand Trunk Project was launched back in 2017, we specifically ensured that it was inclusive of all religions. So, um, we said it was a means of bringing together Hindu, Sikh and Muslim communities, but also other communities from uh, the Indian subcontinent. And that worked well because we were then overcoming some of those uh, differences. And in fact, one of the events that I remember quite clearly is going to a uh, Ravi Das Gordwara in uh, Luton. So uh, Ravi Dasis are formerly a Sikh sect, which some of whom have now left the Sikh community and others wish to remain in the Sikh community. Uh, and this was a Gordwara which had decided to remain in the community. 
but we had a story there where two people, one was a, uh, a Muslim uh, individual who was from Pakistan, another was uh, an Indian Sikh uh, who now lives in Luton. They spoke about the horrors that they experienced during partition. They said that they saw people of other communities killing their friends, killing their families. Um, one of them, I believe, saw his uncle being killed before his eyes. Uh, and yet at the end of their respective stories, the two of them hugged each other. And they hugged each other because they said that that's the past. And we have also seen others who helped us from the various communities and who supported us. So seeing that in such an emotive setting, seeing all of the people who were there with tears, uh, really touched by their respective stories, made it quite clear that this needs to go beyond any kind of sectarian identities, beyond any faith identities. Faith is important. And so that will be discussed within the events. But this is about, it, it's a twofold thing. And perhaps this is the best time for us to explain the motto. Our motto is celebrate, educate, uh, celebrate, commemorate, educate. Celebrate South Asian heritage in all of its glory, including its history, arts and identities. Um, commemorate the important dates in the past, which is why the South Asian Heritage Month has those particular dates. And then educate, make sure that everyone leaves having learned something new from the month. I learned so much from the month and I know that Benita did as well. And as part of that, we're, we kind of work twofold, which is we work to promote this within the South Asian communities in the UK and, and elsewhere, but also within British society more widely so that they can better understand South Asian communities and history in particular. Yeah, and I, th I think for me, it was, um, I go back to that realization um, that I didn't know about our shared uh, heritage because I think we, we don't focus on that. I'd, I'd heard a lot of sentiment growing up about hatred and people killing people. But actually when I went back to that village, the elders who I spoke to remembered my family talked about how uh, my grandfather's house was the center of the village. Um, he was quite a wealthy Hindu landowner. He used to um, employ uh, many of the local Muslims. So they all used to eat together and they used to drink together and they were neighbors and friends. And actually in that village, there was still um, uh, kind of monuments to the, the Hindus that were there, um, the, the little sort of, you know, the temples. And it, it was just like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I just, I always just thought they were always, they always hated each other. And because that's what I was, I had been taught to believe. And I thought we don't speak with one voice and why don't we speak with one voice? Um, and another kind of thing that really struck me was when I, I went back to Bangladesh, uh, never been there before, um, but to Bengal, I'm a Bengali, and I ate the most incredible Bengali food I've had in my life <laughs> in this tiny little village in the middle of nowhere. And they were speaking Bengali that I can understand, and I'm thinking this is a Muslim country, it's completely different um, to anything I know, and yet I feel strangely at home here because I can understand the language and the food just is my food. Um, so Bengalis are Bengalis, and Punjabis are Punjabis, and we kind of wanted to capture that spirit whilst still celebrating people's differences. Um, we think difference is strength. Uh, not a weakness. So it was kind of trying to wrap all of that up into the campaign. Um, so we come at it from very different angles, but um, ultimately want the same thing. I, I think Jasvir and I, we, we kind of balance each other quite well. <laughs> we really do. Yeah, we do. And I think that's, the, we kind of reflect the diversity of the South Asian experience within Britain as well. Those who know a lot about their heritage and those who don't, and those who want to learn more uh, and those who want to educate. Oh, that's marvelous, really. And I like the subtext of opening up to not just South Asians, but speak to the whole British community and um, educate non-South Asian heritage people as well. Um, and it's really marvelous. And do you feel that there is some competition with Black History Month and other minorities who um, do you think there's something to watch out for? in terms of people want to feel they are being taken over by South Asian, right? Yeah, no, not at all. And we've worked really hard to foster kind of um, a relationship where we support Black History Month and they're supporting us. It's about all of our stories. We don't have a monopoly on trauma or, 
<laughs> you know, the, the, the experiences of diaspora. Um, so no, we, we're very, we're, we're very collaborative in, in that sense. And we've not had any problems at all, as far as I'm aware, um, in that space, Jasper, have we? No, we've had no problems at all. And in fact, one of the things that we're looking at doing for next year is talking about the, uh, the black Indian experience. Uh, the, the Indian groups so that could fall into Black History Month that could fall into South Asian Heritage Month you know there's we need to remember that we don't all fall into neat silos so whilst some people like to um, say that South, South Asian Heritage Month is a brown heritage month or brown history month it's beyond that because are we then excluding those who are of Anglo Indian heritage who uh, have had an, ex uh, an extraordinary presence in South Asia for a considerable period of time. Um, and their stories are valid uh, and their stories often get hidden behind, um, certainly in kind of post-independence, uh, India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. No one talks about the Anglo-Indians who've been left behind. We have the, the Parsis who don't have their histories being spoken about quite as openly. Uh, and so it is about making sure that any minorities within South Asia have the opportunity to be included within South Asian Heritage Month. And then also talking about those stories where we may not know too much about you know, how this came into being, um, such as, you know, Sophia Dalip Singh, who's used often as a, a very good example of someone who was very much embedded within British aristocracy, and yet was South Asian, and was of a Punjabi heritage, was of Sikh heritage, but was a baptised Christian and was very much a member of the Church of England. So how do you start disentangling that and saying, this is someone who's South Asian or is this someone who was British? You can't. She, she was all of that. Yeah. Well, nice, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say there's a nice question in the chat that was for Sparsh actually around um, the... Yes, I, I was just coming to that. And I, would Sadiq Khabib want to ask the question himself? Uh, is that allowed or shall I just read it out? I think on no, you have to read it out. I think you have yeah. to read it out. Yeah, you do. Thank you. Amanda. Yeah. So, Benita, would you like to, uh, you yeah, were referring so, to it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a question for Sparsh, um, just to saying that his, his, um, his talk was incredibly moving and thank you. But speaking as a Portuguese South Asian, what do you think about the idea of de developing collaborations to explore other post-colonial and post-partition diasporic routes? Um, it's something we've discussed, isn't it, Jasper? Because you know, yeah. when you sort of get into into all of this, um, there is just so much, and and so many different groups who who don't feel celebrated in in any way. Um, yeah, there is, and it's about creating the space so that those stories can be spoken about. Last year, we had events where the uh, the going experience was discussed, uh, and I think we had the uh, the Attorney General. Um, is it Suella Braverman? I, I forget her name, I'm afraid. Um, she spoke at that particular event and it was organised by um, the Goan Association uh, of Britain, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's important because so many of us forget that Goa wasn't part of Britain. It wasn't part of the British Empire. It remained a distinct uh, area uh, under Portuguese rule for a considerable period of time. And so that's why Goan cuisine is very different to Maharashtran uh, or Marathi cuisine. There are, there are differences there as well, which is very important for us to bear in mind when it comes to what it means to be uh, South Asian. Um, I've, I have a, a good friend of mine who's, um, who's uh, of a, a Goan uh, background himself. Uh, and I remember talking to him and understanding why he was called D'Souza when he was brown and just trying to work out why he had a, a Portuguese surname effectively. So those are important conversations that we all need to have. But yeah, there's always going to be scope for us to discuss yeah. those other areas, including for next year, the Ugandan and uh, East African experiences. Yeah, and I think um, this year, well, next year is going to be a really good opportunity to start talking about those other journeys of empire because that's our theme. Um, so Sadiq, <laughs> there might be a there might be an event or something that you might want to think about putting on because uh, we 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 rely on the communities and the public coming to us with ideas and say we want to talk about this um, and we can support that then. 
definitely so please do get in touch with us Sadiq if you want to uh, organize that event yeah that's for Zana do you want you want to say something would you like to unmute yes yeah sorry thank you um I just wanted to ask thank you so much for that that was fantastic um and it's just so great to hear all the, the wonderful work that you're doing can I ask um a little bit more about um the sort of family uh, perspective to it uh, I mean I saw your your program it's amazing so how, how how much do you get sort of future generations involved in your in your um activities um so we've got a big theme around schools um and the, the partition education group is doing a lot of work around that but also what happened this year is that the various councils reached out to us so um probably the best example of that is telford and Recon council who actually put on a whole program of events for both primary and secondary schools. Um, one of the big downsides of the, the, the dates we've chosen are that it falls largely in the summer holidays. But the way we're gonna get around that is that we're gonna encourage schools to have an engagement week that um, will probably fall before the summer holidays, kind of in the last few, in July sometime. Um, and the council did some wonderful things, they did a whole, program for the kids to learn about the different countries. Um, one of the counsellors, Raj Mehta, went around the schools doing talks and um, engaging them in like some fun stuff and then some, some kind of educational stuff. Um, and it was brilliant. So we're now working with a wider group, including the BAME Education Network, to try and create a toolkit for schools uh, that they can um, kind of then just reach for and say, well, we want to do something for South Asian heritage. Here's some things you can do. Um, and we want to build on that year on year. So it's kind of last year it was one, this year it was one council um, with others, individual schools interested. We want to spread that to, to more councils and, and, and eventually we hope that everybody will, it'll become part of the, the school calendar. And is this secondary schools? Both. So uh, primary as well. Primary yeah, as well. Right. So we think sort of that key stage to Absolutely. age is a really good time to start these conversations. By the time they get to 11, and above, actually many of their biases will already be very ingrained. And so actually you wanna start these conversations early, um, the earlier the better, but then there's obviously certain things you can't really mm. <laughs> discuss when they're too young, because um, it's difficult, so. Because I know, and, I'm talking to Sparsh, I, I know that. that. Sorry, go on, Jasmine. No, I was just gonna add that um, when it comes to that, it may even be something that um, some of the uh, the attendees can help us with because you will hopefully still have connections with your schools. And if you're able to reach out to uh, your, your secondary schools or other schools that you have connections with, um, please do drop us a line, see how we can build up those networks where we want to expand. All of our work is done voluntarily. So the more volunteers we have helping us, the better really. No, that's wonderful. And there's a question in the chat from Sanjukta Ghosh. She says, in your survey of the diaspora, do you think most people would want to forget the political legacy of partition? In that case, how do we present hidden histories and curriculums for future generations? Yeah, it's a really great question because um, that is a view that we do get thrown at us. Uh, you know, forget about it now, it's in the past, you don't need to keep bleating on about partition. Um, and I think the, the discussion we had in Parliament about the Partition Commemoration Day captured it really well. I think to really understand um, modern day Britain, you can't skim over these topics. You know, partition was the, one of, it was the biggest mass migration in the history of humanity. Um, 15 million people displaced overnight. It's, it's responsible for so much of what is going on in the modern world to just sort of go, oh, well, that was then, this is now. It's, 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 you have to understand your past if you're going to make a better future. Um, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the response we have. It, of course, some people would rather forget about it because the, the memories are very, very painful. And I think it has taken this generation, my generation, the one below us to want to talk about it because my dad's generation certainly didn't want yeah. to because of what they witnessed and the trauma then gets passed down as well. So yeah, it has to be done sensitively. And what we've discussed really is that the best way to do it is through storytelling. 
bit like we did in the documentary. It got such a huge response because it wasn't a history lesson. Yeah. It was telling people stories, which is kind of what Sparsh is doing as well. Yeah, I think it also helps to see the work that's being done by others in the UK at the moment. Um, one thing that comes to mind is Empire Land by Satnam Singera, which is uh, an incredible book. I um, ended up reading it over the course of a weekend. I just got so entrenched in it. And it's a, it's a kind of easy to access book for uh, people who aren't necessarily historians, but who want to see the impact that uh, Empire has had on our identity in the present day. And I know that there's the uh, the Channel 4 series, which has started uh, this week, which I, I haven't seen yet, but it's on my list of things to do. Um, it's, it's a fantastic book because it kind of opens up uh, how we can have those discussions. I mean, even things like, you know, if we start thinking about um, partition and the impact it had, it had a political impact in the UK as well, because it was a, a Labour government which ensured that partition took place. But then it was the establishment and the established civil servants who ensured that the partition line took place in the way that it did. So when we start looking at how that happened and how the political elite didn't necessarily um, do what the government of the day was hoping to achieve and how those discussions which took place during the summer of 1947, which led to partition, led to what we continue to see as the, um, the fault lines in South Asia at the present day. There's a, a huge legacy that's been left behind. And that's before we even start to talk about the uh, one to two million people who were killed during partition, the greatest migration in living history. Before we start looking at the partition museums in Amritsar, uh, in uh, Pakistan, in India more generally, there's a lot that still needs to be done and for us to learn from it. And yes, people want to forget the, uh, the political legacy of it, um, but I don't think we can. And I hope that future generations will make sure we never forget. I would also, I would also just add to that, that um, something that I have uh, done as a result of this, you know, epiphany I've had um, is that I'm, I've, I've started doing some really some, some proper work around health inequalities. And when you start looking at health inequalities and um, how they have how we have had, for example, the outcomes we've had in COVID and the disproportional, disproportionate effect on brown and black people. When you start scratching the surface of that, it's so multi-layered, but there is a part of it that is the hangover of empire and the legacy of empire um, and migration. And until you start really understanding that, it's quite hard to unpick um, how to tackle the health inequalities. So, you know, the East African migration story is very different to the asylum seekers we're seeing now from North Africa to the Pakistani experience, the Bangladeshi experience, and yet it's all lumped together as BAME. And, you know, uh, and it's not surprising that, that all these health inequalities exist. So it's given me a much deeper understanding. I'm now able to start leading some work around this in, in Manchester where I work. Um, and, and that understanding of history is so important for that. No, totally. And as you were saying, it's not just the history of the violence, it's the history of the saviors, because I have students in my partition, I teach partition at SOAS, and I have students who say, why did my family not migrate? And the presence of the numbers of Muslim and uh, minority groups in India is really important to recognize their presence. They felt comfortable and safe in their neighborhoods, and that's not to forget that either. And um, to recognize that given the current um, political temper in the country, it's important that uh, there's a different message in Britain that has to go back home as well, because there's a lot of uh, diaspora nostalgia that sometimes feeds the exclusivist mentalities in South Asia. So. I mean, it's so important to have this open conversation in Britain to feed back also to South Asia. And I think that's important to remember and to always link partition with peace building. It's, it's impossible to, um, to remember it as a horror stay, I feel. It's not, it, we don't want to remember it as a horror stay. We want to remember it as a celebration. Uh, and I think that's really important. And your message there is really, very, very relevant, both for Britain and South Asia.
Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think it's that lack of knowledge in the wider British public that then just perpetuates the inequalities. And there's a really nice bit in, in Satnam's programme that went out on Saturday night where he goes back to Wolverhampton and he talks to the lady who lives in the house he lived in as a, as a kid and and you know mentioned something about the empire and she says oh yeah I don't I don't really bother with all that stuff um <laughs> because no one's <laughs> told that she needs to you know, no one's ever talks about it and it so yeah it's it's a great program do watch it quite hard hitting at times I think <laughs> the other thing to bear in mind is that um when you look at South Asia today um it's taken diaspora communities to ensure that for example um, we've had Remembrance Day, Remembrance Sunday, talking about the number of um, people who fought in the First and Second World Wars uh, and the impact there. Um, it's been the diaspora communities who've ensured that that history hasn't been forgotten because India and Pakistan wanted to willfully forget that they had fought in a war that supported the British, um, which is why you never saw any remembrance services taking place in India or Pakistan for ever since partition took place, really. And so we're seeing that changing with remembrance services now taking place in uh, in Delhi, I think, for the first time I saw them this year. It may have been a couple of years ago, but it's something which has only started very recently. And those are histories of um, soldiers from the Punjab region, um, which is, um, I think it's punjabww1.com, which is a new resource that's been set up by the UK Punjab Heritage Association and the University of Greenwich which is a fantastic resource showing you can trace family members from Punjab um, to see where they fought, what they did, what their involvement was within the, the First World War in particular. Uh, and those resources are things that the, the media in India in particular has been singing the praises of. So there's a lot of work that we can do in the diaspora Absolutely. which ensures that those stories are not forgotten in South Asia itself. Absolutely, and remembered. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank just, you very say, much. Jasveer, if you could share that with us, you know, the details of that uh, resource would be really invaluable. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, is there any more questions? Uh, you could, I can't see any audience, so it has to be in the chat box. Yes, we're asking uh, participants to, to put their questions there. Yeah. So um, I had one last little thing in terms of future. You said that this month, uh, the, the coming year, 2022, you already working on a theme. And do you, and how would uh, somebody volunteer for that or just write to you on your emails or yes. do you have any system for the future planning? Uh, well, yeah, we do also have some vac vacancies that are advertised on the website, so we can put that oh, in. Okay. Um, but best thing is just have a chat so we can understand what people's skills are and then maybe get them, you know, fit them into the right place in the campaign. Yes, so that's, that's marvellous. I'm going to do that soon. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to participate. And uh, so lovely. Thank you so much for speaking with us. And if there are, um, yeah, I see you've put the South Asian <laughs> heritage vacancies up as yeah, well. Yeah, I'll just put it in so okay. everyone can see. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Um, thank you very much, Jasbir Singh and Benita Khani. It's been lovely listening to you and hearing about South Asian Heritage Month and all your education programs as well. That the education project also sounds amazing. Um, and thank you and keep in touch with SOAS. I'm sure uh, there'll be other events we would all like to follow up with. And uh, yeah, and Sparsh, though he is not here, he's bringing the exhibition to SOAS next year from yes. October to December. So um, yeah, keep in touch on the, in this space for the audience and join us again. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say it. thank yeah. you so much to you all for a brilliant, brilliant panel talk. And yes, please, let's keep in touch. Let's see how we can collaborate. Uh, would love to work further with South Asian History Month. And um, yeah, and, and, and Project Dastan, as you said, yes, is coming to, to Brunei Gallery. It'll be coming between October and December of 2022. And there's um, 
hopefully more outreach work to go with that we're hoping to take it also to schools and uh, in more of an academic angle to it as well which i'm looking forward to uh, to working with super thank, thank you very, you very much Thanks, thanks. Thank thanks. you very much. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Take care. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, thanks for having us. And thanks everyone for coming as well. Um, we're going to we we're going to put the recording of this up on YouTube. So if anyone's missed it or came in late, then don't worry. It will be up on YouTube and feel free to share it um widely as well. So thank you everyone. Um we will be calling this a day. Thanks. For thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.